Gaza in Crisis Reflections on Israel's War Against the Palestinians by Elon Papp and Noam Chomsky edited by Frank Barat Audiobook presented by the Learner's Library Contents Chapter 7 The Killing Fields of Gaza Chapter 8 A Middle East Peace That Could Happen But Won't Chapter 7 the Killing Fields of Gaza 2004-2009 Preface The Gaza Strip is a little bit more than 2% of Palestine. This small detail is never mentioned whenever the Strip is in the news nor has it been mentioned during the Israeli onslaught on Gaza, in January 2009. Indeed it is such a small part of the country that it never existed as a separate region in the past. Gaza's history before the Zionization of Palestine was not unique and it was always connected administratively and politically to the rest of Palestine. It was until 1948 an integral and natural part of the country. As one of Palestine's principal land and sea gates to the rest of the world it tended to develop a more flexible and cosmopolitan way of life not dissimilar to other gateways societies in the eastern Mediterranean in the modern era. This location near the sea and on the Via Maris to Egypt and Lebanon brought with it prosperity and stability until this life was disrupted, and nearly destroyed by the Israeli ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948. Between 1948 and 1967, Gaza became a huge refugee camp restricted severely by the respective Israeli and Egyptian policies. Both states disallowed any movement out of the Strip. Living conditions were already harsh then as the victims of the 1948 Israeli politics of dispossession doubled the number of the inhabitants who had lived there for centuries. On the eve of the Israeli occupation in 1967, the catastrophic nature of this enforced demographic transformation was evident all over the Strip. This once pastoral coastal part of southern Palestine became within two decades one of the world's densest areas of habitation, without any adequate economic infrastructure to support it. The first 20 years of Israeli occupation allowed at least some movement outside an area that was closed off as a war zone. In the years 1948 to 1967, tens of thousands of Palestinians were permitted to join the Israeli labor market as unskilled and underpaid workers. The price Israel demanded for this slave market was a total surrender of any national struggle or agenda. When this was not complied with, the, the gift of laborers' movement was denied and abolished. All these years, leading to the Oslo Accord in 1993, were marked by an Israeli attempt to construct the Strip as an enclave, which the Israeli peace camp hoped would be either autonomous or part of Egypt and the nationalist camp, wished to include in the greater Eretz Israel they dreamed of establishing instead of Palestine. The Oslo Agreement enabled the Israelis to reaffirm the Strip's status as a separate geopolitical entity not just outside of Palestine as a whole, but also cut off from the West Bank. Ostensibly, both the Gaza Strip and the West Bank were under the Palestinian Authority but any human movement between them depended on Israel's goodwill, a rare Israeli trait that almost disappeared when Benjamin Netanyahu came to power in 1996. Moreover, Israel held, as it still does today, the water and electricity infrastructure. Since 1993 it used, or rather abused, this possession in order to ensure, on the one hand, the well-being of the Jewish settler community and, on the other, to blackmail the Palestinian population into submission and surrender. The people of the Gaza Strip thus vacillated in the last 60 years between being internees, hostages, or prisoners in an impossible human space. It is within this historical context that we should view the massacre that took place in January 2009 and the violence 
raging in Gaza in the preceding five years. The violence was not only meted out by Israeli forces, there was a fair share of inter-Palestinian fighting for a short while. Although one should say that given the nature of the Israeli occupation and policy this internal violence was far less than would be expected under such circumstances. But this internal phase is a minor aspect of a far more important issue, Israeli violence against the Gaza Strip. We look back from our current vantage point, we see more clearly than ever before the fallacy of the Israeli discourse and justification for its actions in Gaza. Its politicians and diplomats defined the policies against Gaza as a war against terror, directed against a local branch of Al-Qaeda and one that was meant to fend off a seditious Iranian penetration into this part of the world. Its academics preferred to depict Gaza as another arena in the dreaded clash of civilizations. However, the origins of the particular violent history of the Gaza Strip lie elsewhere. The recent history of the Strip, 60 years of dispossession, occupation, and imprisonment, inevitably produced internal violence such as we witnessed in the last few years as it produced other unbearable features of life lived under such impossible conditions. In fact, if we take even a closer look at the five years preceding the cast lead operation we can provide a sure analysis of the motivation for the violence directed against the Palestinians in 2009. There are two historical contexts for what happened in Gaza in January that year. One takes us back to the foundation of the State of Israel through the occupation of the Strip by Israel, in 1967 and up to the failed Oslo Accord of 1993. The second is the one presented here, an escalation of an Israeli policy that culminated with the events of 2009. The ideology of ethnic cleansing adopted in 1948 as the main tool for implementing the dream of a safe and democratic Jewish state led to the occupation of the Gaza Strip in 1967, which lasted until 2005, when Israel allegedly withdrew. The Gaza Strip was already encircled with an electric fence in 1994 as part of the preparation for peace with the Palestinians, and became a ghetto in 2000 when the peace process was declared dead. The decision of the people of Gaza to resist this closure, by violent and non-violent means, confronted the Israeli military and political elite with a new dilemma. They assumed that locking Gazans in a huge prison would settle the problem for a long while, but this turned out to be wrong. So they were looking for a new strategy. The bitter fruits of this strategy were revealed in January 2009 and the international community reacted furiously, but ineffectively. The main byproduct of this international fury was the Goldstone Report. It summarizes well, although in a very cautious and limited way, the scope of the carnage left by Israel after hostilities subsided. The international community, however, did not inquire why such a ruthless policy was pursued and what were its immediate origins. Moving to a new strategy, 2000-2005. Ever since 2000, the Israeli military escalated its actions against the Palestinians and the anti-Israeli forces in Lebanon. It began with military operations in the West Bank in reaction to the Second Intifada which also included the construction of the apartheid or segregation wall and culminated in the attack on Lebanon, in 2006 and the assault on Gaza in 2009. This was accompanied by an equally ruthless policy of dispossession and incremental transfer of Palestinians, from the greater Jerusalem area in the same years. One pretext for action all over the country was the increasing political power by Islamic groups such as Hamas, in the occupied territories, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and the Islamic movement inside Israel. 
The reasons for these draconian policies go back to the formative years of Zionism and the conception of an ideology that moved successive Israeli governments to seek unchallenged domination in Palestine and beyond, all over the eastern Mediterranean. The number of regional states and local Palestinian movements willing to confront this domination seemed to have gradually decreased. Before 2006 and Israeli policymakers sensed that their overall strategy was winning the day. They were particularly satisfied with the situation in the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip after the Second Intifada, subsided around the year 2005. The matrix of walls, fences, checkpoints, colonial settlements, Israeli-only bypass roads, and military bases Israel has spread all over the West Bank turned it in their eyes into a, a pacified territory. However, the situation in Gaza was different. There the Israelis were facing determined resistance, as the Hamas movement, like Hezbollah in Lebanon before it, refused to succumb to Israel's will. For the then Israeli Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon, and the main political class of those days, which remains even more at the center of Israeli politics today, Ehud Barak, Shimon Peres, Tsipi Livni, and Benjamin Netanyahu, controlling the Gaza Strip from the outside while carving the West Bank into manageable bantustans seemed the best solution for the Palestine problem. The new strategy was conceived on the training grounds of the Israeli army in the dummy city built by the army in the Negev. 2004, the dummy city. In 2004, the Israeli army began building a dummy Arab city in the Negev desert. It was the size of a real city, with streets, all of them given names, mosques, public buildings, and cars. Built at a cost of $45 million, this phantom city became a dummy Gaza in the winter of 2006, after Hezbollah fought Israel to a draw in the north, so that the IDF could prepare to fight an improved war against Hamas in the south after the fiasco in the north. When the Israeli chief of general staff Dan Halutz visited the site after the Lebanon war, he told the press that soldiers, we're preparing for the scenario that will unfold in the dense neighborhood of Gaza City. A week into the bombardment of Gaza, Ehud Barak attended a rehearsal for the ground war. Foreign television crews filmed him as he watched ground troops conquer the dummy city, storming the empty houses and no doubt killing the terrorists hiding in them. More often than not such maneuvers ended in the destruction of the enemy base. The Israeli NGO Breaking the Silence, Shavrim Shedaka, published in 2009 a report about its members, mostly reserve soldiers, experiences in Operation Cast Lead. The gist of the evidence was that the soldiers had orders to attack Gaza as if they were assaulting a massive and fortified enemy line. This transpired from the firepower and troops formation employed. The absence of any orders or procedures about acting within a civilian space, and the synchronized effort from the land, sea, and air conventional armies employed against huge armadas of tanks, armored cars, and hundreds of thousands of ground troops. Among the worst were the senseless demolition of houses, the spraying of civilians with phosphorus shells, the killing of innocent civilians by light weaponry and orders by the commanders to act without moral inhibitions. You feel like an infantile child with a magnifying glass that torments ants, you burn them, testified one soldier. In short as they were trained in practice to deal with the dummy city, they enacted the total destruction of the real city. 2005, First Rains the militarization of Israeli policy toward the Gaza Strip began in 2005. Gaza became in that year a military target in the official Israeli view, as if it were a huge enemy base and not a civilian and human space. Gaza is a city as any other city in the world, 
and yet for the Israelis it became a dummy city on which soldiers experimented with the most recent and updated weapons. This policy was enabled by the Israeli government's decision to evict the Jewish settlers who colonized the Gaza Strip since 1967. The settlers were moved allegedly as part of what the government described as a unilateral policy of disengagement. The argument was that since there was no progress in the peace talks with the Palestinians, it was up to Israel to determine what its final borders with the Palestinian areas would look like. But things did not turn out the way they were expected to. The eviction was followed by a Hamas takeover, first in democratic elections, then in a preemptive coup staged to avert an American and Israeli-backed seizure by Fatah. The immediate Israeli response was to impose an economic blockade on the Strip to which Hamas retaliated by firing missiles, at the nearest town to the Strip, Steret. This gave Israel a pretext to use its air force, artillery, and gunships. Israel claimed to be shooting at the launching areas of the missiles, but in practice this meant anywhere and everywhere in Gaza. Creating the prison and throwing the key into the sea, as UN Special Rapporteur John Dugard has put it, was an option the Palestinians in Gaza reacted against with force already in September 2005. They were determined to show at the very least that they were still part of the West Bank and Palestine. In that month, they launched the first significant, in number not quality, barrage of missiles into the western Negev, as. Often, these resulted in damage to some property but very rarely in human casualties. The events of that month deserve a detailed mention, because the early Hamas response before September was a trickle of sporadic missiles. The launch in September 2005 was in response to an Israeli campaign of mass arrests of Hamas and Islamic Jihad activists in the Tul Karim area. One could not escape the impression at the time that the army was looking to trigger a Hamas reaction that would allow Israel to escalate its attacks. And indeed Israeli retaliation came in the form of a harsh policy of massive killing, the first of its kind codenamed First Rains. It is worth dwelling for a moment on the nature of that operation. The discourse that accompanied it was that of punishment and it resembled punitive measures inflicted in the more distant past, by colonialist powers, and more recently by dictatorships, against rebellious imprisoned or banished communities. A frightening show of the oppressors might end with a large number of dead and wounded among the victims. In first rains, supersonic planes were flown over Gaza to terrorize the entire population, succeeded by the heavy bombardment of vast areas from the sea, sky, and land. The logic, the Israeli army explained, was to create pressure so as to weaken the Gaza community's support for the rocket launchers as was expected, by the Israelis as well. The operation only increased the support for the rocket launchers and gave impetus to their next attempts. In hindsight, and especially given the Israeli military commander's explanation, that the army had long been preparing the cast lead operation, too it is possible that the real purpose of that particular operation was experimental. And if the Israeli generals wished to know how such operations would be received at home, in the region, and in the world, it seems that instantly the answer was very well, namely, no one took an interest in the scores of dead and hundreds of wounded Palestinians left behind after first rains subsided. And hence since first rains and until June 2006, all the following operations were similarly modeled. The difference was in their escalation, more firepower, more casualties, and more collateral damage and, as to be expected, more Qassam missiles in response. Accompanying measures in 2006 were more sinister means of ensuring the full imprisonment of the people of Gaza through boycott and blockade, while the world at large kept silent. 2006, Summer Rains and Autumn Clouds 
the eviction of the settlers from the Strip in 2005 and the victory of Hamas there in early 2006, seemed to transform this region into a battlefield. No longer under the authority of the PA and without the presence of vulnerable settlers, it became a purely a military problem. However, 2006 was not such a good year for the Israeli army. It failed to deter and defeat Hezbollah in southern Lebanon in a war Israel initiated. This coincided with the capture of an Israeli soldier in a daring military operation by Hamas. Israeli actions were motivated by the dual sense of humiliation on the one hand and a sense of immunity, at least from the society at home, to react vehemently to any show of Palestinian resistance in Gaza. With the help of an inciting media and jingoistic public mood the events in the summer of 2006 allowed the policymakers to use brutal military power as a short-term reaction to a problem they had no idea how to solve politically. The frustration that propelled the strongest army in the Middle East against civilians in Gaza could only end in a disastrous way, as indeed it did. Let us analyze closely these three elements that led to further escalation in the operations against Gaza, and to the barbarization of this front in an unprecedented way. These elements were frustration, the search for a pretext, and the absence of a political strategy. Israeli experts and pundits were the first to make the point that the escalation of firepower and military action in 2006 was a direct response to the frustration of the army due to its relative defeat in the North Point 2 the army needed to demonstrate its superiority and deterrence capability, still broadcast by its chiefs as the main safeguards for the Jewish state's survival in a hostile world. The Islamist character of both Hamas and Hezbollah and an alleged, and totally fabricated, association of both with Al-Qaeda enabled the army to imagine Israel spearheading a global war against jihadism in Gaza. While George W. Bush was in power, the killing of women and babies in Gaza could be justified by the American administration as being part of a holy war against Islam, a practice not alien to the American forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, under the banner of fighting terrorism. The humiliation did not end with the debacle in Lebanon but continued with the capture by the Hamas of an Israeli soldier, Galad Shalit, in the summer of 2006. One humiliation too many, cried Haaretz after the abduction. The paper reported furious generals demanding brutal reaction to both Hezbollah and Hamas. The ruthless Israeli reaction was also due to the absence of a clear policy. The Israeli leadership in September 2006 seemed to be at a loss for what to do with the Gaza Strip. Reading its statements at the time, one gathers the government of that year was quite confident about its policy toward the West Bank, but not toward the Strip. The Israeli official line is that the final delineation of Israel's eastern border has nearly been completed. This is probably why the West Bank, or the occupation, as issues have been removed from the domestic agenda and ceased to be a divisive factor in Israel's political life as it had been for a while after 1967. The unilateral policy of annexing about half of the West Bank continued with extra zeal in 2007, and was fully supported by the Jewish electorate. It was somewhat delayed by the promises Israel made, under the road map, to stop building new settlements. Israel found two ways of circumventing this impediment. First, it defined a third of the West Bank as Greater Jerusalem, which allowed it to build towns and community centers within this new annexed area. Second, it expanded old settlements to such proportions that there was no need to build new ones. This trend was given an additional push in 2006, hundreds of caravans in outposts, mitzvim in Hebrew, were installed to delineate the boundaries of the Jewish sphere within the Palestinian territories. 
The master plans for the new towns and neighborhoods were finalized and the apartheid bypass roads and highway system were completed. In all, the settlements, army bases, roads, and wall prepared the ground for the final stages in this strategy. Within the territories informally annexed to Israel, and those that might still be incorporated in the Jewish state, there is still a considerable number of Palestinians against whom, at the end of 2006, the Israeli authorities began pursuing a policy of a creeping transfer. Very little international attention has been paid to this de-Arabization of Jerusalem, too boring a subject for the Western media to bother with and too elusive for human rights organizations, to make a general point about. There was no rush as far as the Israelis were concerned, they felt in the beginning of 2007 that they had the upper hand there. The daily abusive and dehumanizing heavy military and bureaucratic hands of the regime were as effective as ever in furthering the process of dispossessing Palestine. This strategy was first conceived by Ariel Sharon in 2001 and became the cornerstone of all the successive government's policies. It won the day, and international immunity, in particular, since the only other meaningful political alternative the Israeli political scene offered was a crude a transferist policy, advocated by the popular Israeli Baitenu party and its leader, Avigdor Lieberman, and by a coalition of right-wing parties. In 2005, Prime Minister Ehud Olmert named this strategy in gathering. This was a self-justification for pursuing unilateral action in the West Bank, since there was no progress in the peace process. In practice it meant that the 2006 Israeli government wished to annex the parts it coveted, more or less half of the West Bank, and try and push out, or at least enclave within it, the native population, while allowing the other half of the West Bank to develop in a way that would not endanger Israeli interests either by being ruled by a submissive Palestinian authority or by associating directly with Jordan. This was a fallacy, but nonetheless it won the enthusiastic vote of most of the Jews in the country, when Olmert turned it into an essential part of his election campaign. The clear policy toward the West Bank highlighted the confusion about the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip, in the eyes of the Israelis, was a very different geopolitical entity from that of the West Bank. Hamas had already controlled the Gaza Strip for almost a year, while the leader of the Fatah faction, Abu Mazen, was running the fragmented West Bank with Israeli and American blessing. Unlike in the West Bank there was no chunk of land in Gaza that Israel coveted and there was no hinterland, like Jordan, to which the Palestinians of Gaza could be expelled. Egypt, unlike Jordan, succeeded in persuading the Israelis, already in 1967, that for them the Gaza Strip was a liability and would never form part of Egypt. So a million and half Palestinians remained an Israeli problem and responsibility, although geographically the Strip is located on the margins of the State of Israel, psychologically it was still in 2006 very much in its midst. The Israeli tactics, as different from strategy, were clearer. Should the people in Gaza reconcile with the imprisonment until either the PA retook the Strip or Israel found a better solution, then the area could be managed the way Palestinians are treated in the West Bank. Should they resist, as indeed they did, Gatoiza, Tyan and Strangulation, then the policy of punitive actions would continue. The inhuman living conditions in the Strip disabled the people who lived there from reconciling with the imprisonment Israel had imposed on them ever since 1967. There were relative better periods when movement to the West Bank and into Israel for work was allowed, but these better times were gone by 2006. Harsher realities were in place since 1987. Some access to the outside world was allowed as long as there were Jewish settlers in the Strip, 
but once they were removed the strip was hermetically closed. Ironically, most Israelis, according to 2006 polls, looked at Gaza as an independent Palestinian state that Israel has graciously allowed to emerge. The leadership, and particularly the army, saw it as a prison with the most dangerous community of inmates, which had to be managed ruthlessly one way or another. Thus, the ghettoization of the Palestinians in Gaza did not reap any dividends. The ghettoized community continued to express its will for life by firing primitive missiles into Israel. Ghettoizing or quarantining unwanted communities, even if they were regarded as dangerous, has never worked in history as a solution. The Jews know it best from their own history. The final strategy was not articulated and in its stead it seemed that the daily military activity began to emerge, as the new strategy itself and thus the punitive tactics turned into genocidal strategy in 2006. What was missing for a significant escalation was a pretext. The history of the most brutal Israeli actions against the Palestinians is loaded with such pretexts. Ever since 1948, the Israeli army and government searched for adequate pretext for any massive operations against the Palestinians. This was the case in 1947 and 1948. The actual ethnic cleansing began only after the Palestinians reacted angrily against the UN Partition Resolution of November 1947 and attacked isolated Jewish settlements, and assaulted Jewish transport on Palestine's roads. This spontaneous reaction subsided after a short while but was enough to provide the pretext for a massive operation of ethnic cleansing, conceived as an option already in the 1930s. Similarly, the invasion of Lebanon in 1982 was presented as retaliation for the PLO struggle against Israel, a very late in the day and limited Palestinian resistance in the occupied territories after 20 years of oppression. These pretexts were never convincing to the international community yet they never led to any actions against Israel. This is the lesson the Israelis learned in 1982. The international community did not then accept the Israeli justification for the third invasion of its northern neighbor. The previous two invasions were in 1948 and 1978. An international commission of six jurists headed by Sean McBride described that attack, as would Judge Goldstone a quarter of century later when reporting on Gaza, as a series of war crimes. However the McBride Committee was much more explicit, it accused Israel of genocide of the Palestinian communities in Lebanon, although two members of the commission asked to differ on this conclusion but not on the facts. It accused Israel of using forbidden weapons against civilians and the indiscriminate and reckless bombing of civilian targets, schools and hospitals as well as cities, villages, and refugee camps, and it culminated in the Sabra and Shatila massacre, which for a while focused world public opinion on the nature of Israeli policy. It took a while for the Palestinian national movement to recover, but the next attempt to shake off, intifada in Arabic, the Israeli occupation also failed and triggered escalated Israeli reactions. One uprising in 1987 was easily crushed while the other of 2000 took more time to control but also provided the pretext for the renewal of ruthless policies. The pretext for the operations in 2006 was the capture of Galad Shalit. One should not venture too much in any kind of counterfactual history, but it is quite probable that had Shalit not been captured by Hamas, any of that organization's military operations against Israeli policies of strangulation would have served as a pretext for expanded Israeli assaults on the Gaza Strip. The reaction, or rather the initiation, of the next stage, was codenamed Operation Summer Rains, which commenced on June 28, 2006, 
and ended in November that year. The employment of such names by the Israeli army reveals the sinister nature of its intentions and attitudes. The previous operation, as mentioned, was codenamed First Rains, which turned into Summer Rains. Autumn clouds would later follow. In a country where there is no rain in the summer, the only precipitation that one can expect are showers of F-16 bombs and artillery shells hitting the people of Gaza. It was the most brutal attack on Gaza since 1967. In the past, the punitive Israeli actions against the 1.5 million Palestinians entrapped in the Strip were limited to massive bombardment from outside the Strip, from the land, the sea, and the air. This time the army invaded the Strip on the ground and added the firepower of its tanks to the overall bombardment of the most densely populated civilian center on the globe. It was the first Israeli land incursion after the eviction of the settlers a year before. The worst part of it was the Israeli actions in September 2006, when the nature of the Israeli escalation revealed itself more clearly. On an almost daily basis civilians were killed by the Israeli army. September 2 was a typical day in this horror show. 3. Citizens were killed and a whole family was wounded in Beit Hanoun. This was the morning harvest. Before the end of day many more were killed. In September an average of 8 Palestinians died daily in the Israeli attacks on the Strip. Many of them were children. Hundreds were maimed, wounded, and paralyzed. The systematic slaughter more than anything else had the appearance of an inertia killing. When the continued employment of massive power is done as daily routine and not as the implementation of a policy. On December 28, 2006, the Israeli human rights organization Selim published its annual report about the Israeli atrocities in the occupied territories. In that year Israeli forces killed 660 citizens. The number of Palestinians killed by Israel in 2006 tripled in comparison to the previous year, around 200. According to B'Selem, the Israelis killed 141 children in 2006. Most of the dead were from the Gaza Strip where the Israeli forces demolished almost 300 houses and slew entire families. This means that since 2000, Israeli forces killed almost 4,000 Palestinians, a large number of them children. More than 20,000 were wounded. The land invasion enabled the army to kill citizens even more effectively and to present it. As a result of heavy fighting within densely populated areas, an inevitable result, the army spokespersons claimed, of the circumstances but not of Israeli policies. A month and half later the Operation Autumn Clouds was launched and proved to be even more lethal. On November L, 2006, in less than 48 hours, the Israelis killed 70 civilians. By the end of that month, with additional mini-operations accompanying it, almost 200 were killed, half of them children and women. Point twelve. From first rains to autumn clouds one could see escalation in every aspect. The first was the disappearance of the distinction between civilian and non-civilian targets. The senseless killing turned the population at large into a legitimate military target. The second was the escalation in military means, employment of every possible killing machine the Israeli army possessed. Third, the escalation was conspicuous in the number of casualties, with each operation, and each future operation, a much larger number of people were killed and wounded. Finally, and most importantly, the operations became a strategy. This was now clearly the way Israel intended to solve the problem of the Gaza Strip. 2007 to 2008, the policy becomes a strategy. A creeping transfer in the West Bank and a measured policy of systematic killings in the Gaza Strip were the two strategies Israel 
continued to employ in 2007 as well. From an electoral point of view, the one in Gaza was more problematic as it did not reap any tangible results, while the West Bank under Abu Mazen was yielding to Israeli pressure and there seemed to be no significant force that could arrest the Israeli strategy of annexation and dispossession. But Gaza continued to fire back. On the one hand, this enabled the Israeli army to initiate more massive operations, but there was also the great danger. On the other, that as happened in 1948, the army would demand a more drastic and systematic, punitive, and collateral action against the besieged people of the Gaza Strip. The casualties were rising in 2007. 300 people were killed in Gaza, dozens of them children. But even under Bush, and definitely in the post-Bush era, the myth of fighting the world jihad in Gaza was losing its credibility. So a new mythology was proposed in 2007, Gaza was a terrorist base determined to destroy Israel. The only way the Palestinians could be de-terrorized, so to speak, was to consent to live in a strip encircled by barbed wire and walls. Flour, cement, medicine, dairy products, and rice were barred, and movement in and out of the strip restricted, as a result of the political choices made by Gazans. Should they persist in supporting Hamas, they would be strangled and starved until they changed their ideological inclination. Should they succumb to the kind of politics Israel wished them to adopt, they would have the same fate as that of the West Bank life without basic civil and human rights. They could either be inmates in the open prison of the West Bank or incarcerated in the maximum security one of the Gaza Strip. If they resisted, they were likely to be imprisoned without trial, or killed. This was Israel's message in 2007 and the people of Gaza were given a year to make up their minds. In the summer of 2008 an official bilateral ceasefire was declared brokered by Egypt. The Israeli government did not achieve its goals. It needed to prepare more seriously for the next step and that year was used for such preparations. Its strategy depended not only on silencing Hamas in the Gaza Strip but consisted of a desperate attempt to prove to the Quartet, the UN, the EU, the United States, and Russia, and the Palestinian Authority that the situation in the Strip was under its control to the extent that its a solution could be incorporated in an Israeli vision of the future peace. The summer of 2008 was two years after the humiliation of Lebanon. There was no wish in a government, which was subjected to an aggressive inquiry and damning report by an official commission into its failure in the north, to allow the Israeli public to dwell on this open wound for too long. There were also winds of change blowing from Washington where it was feared a new administration would not be as sympathetic to the Israeli strategy, and all in all world public opinion, at least from the bottom up, as it had been since 2000 seemed restive and antagonistic. The old method of waiting for the right pretext to move ahead and escalate the struggle against the only resistance still intact was at work again. Once the pretext was found the army strategists, we now know, intended to upgrade the reaction. The talk in the IDF was now of a new doctrine vis a vis Gaza, the Idahia Doctrine. In October 2008, Haaretz referred for the first time to the doctrine. The gist of it was the comprehensive destruction of areas in their entirety and the employment of disproportional force in response to the launch of missiles. When Haaretz reported the doctrine, the paper referred to it as a future strategy toward Lebanon, hence the Dahia reference. The Shiite quarter that was bombarded to dust in the 2006 Israeli air attack on Beirut. Gadi Eisenkot, the then chief of the Northern Command, said, For us villages are military bases. He talked about total destruction of villages as a punitive action. But his colleague, Colonel Gabi Saboni, 
told an academic conference at the Institute for National Security in Tel Aviv University that this would apply to the Gaza Strip as well. He added that, this is meant to inflict damage that would take ages to recover from. The evidence the NGO breaking the silence found corroborates this description of the doctrine. In a press conference these soldiers convened after the events of January 2009, they explained that the Gaza Strip was tackled as an armed outpost that had to be hammered and wiped out with all the might that the Israeli army could muster. It seems that the doctrine was not just about employing military might, but also achieving the same desired result by other means. In 2008, the Israeli army tightened the blockade on Gaza. This tactical move if analyzed in detail is far more than a punitive action. It is a policy that produced, given the demographic circumstances in the Gaza Strip, genocidal realities, lack of basic food, absence of elementary medicine, and no source of employment. To this one can add a massive claustrophobic traumatization of a million and half. People who were not allowed to move about and lacked essential commodities and building material, which left them without shelter in summer or winter. And if this were not enough, the Israelis cut off the water and electricity supplies. Hamas did not budge and refused to disappear in return for the lifting of the blockade. So another pretext was sought, Israel violated the ceasefire on a daily basis in June 2008 with several attacks from the air and incursions on the ground. Groups that were not affiliated with Hamas retaliated with several rockets, and public opinion in Israel was now ready for a larger operation. And yet this was not enough. In November 2008, the Israeli army attacked a tunnel one of many dug in order to survive the blockade, and claimed that it was a Marxist strike against a future Hamas operation. This time Hamas fired the rockets. It lost six people in the attack and launched a foray of more than 30 rockets. At the end of the month, Hamas declared that such Israeli actions, which became a daily occurrence, terminated the ceasefire. On November 18, 2008, Hamas declared the end of the ceasefire and on the 24th intensified the barrage of missiles for a short, while as a response to the previous Israeli action and ceased soon after. As before there were hardly any casualties on the Israeli side, although houses and flats were damaged and the afflicted citizens traumatized. The November 24th missile attack was the one the Israeli army had waited for. From November 25 until January 21, 2009, the Israeli army bombarded the million and half people of Gaza from the air, land, and sea. Hamas responded with missiles that ended with three casualties and another ten Israeli soldiers were killed, some by friendly fire. A genocidal policy? The evidence collected by Israeli-based human rights organizations, international agencies, and media, although the Israelis barred the media from entering the Strip, was perceived by many to be far more serious than just war crimes. Some referred to it as genocide. It is not often that the President of the UN General Assembly would accuse a member state of genocide. But when the Israeli army bombarded the civilian population of Gaza, invoking the right of self-defense against terrorists launching missiles into civilian targets. Miguel Descoto Brockman did not hesitate to describe such actions as genocide. As a former Roman Catholic priest and Nicaragua's foreign minister his views carry considerable weight. Needless to say, these remarks were promptly dismissed by the Israelis as anti-Semitic, the standard reaction to such accusations. Had his voice been a lonely one in the wilderness, it would have had little resonance, but it was joined by similar expressions of outrage by other senior politicians, especially outside the western corridors of power, who chose the term genocide as the only way to describe the tragedy visited upon the people of Gaza. 
Descoto Brockman's reaction came before the full-scale destruction of homes, schools, and hospitals in many parts of Gaza. A week later, the Turkish columnist and author Oktay Akbal described the Israeli actions as the real genocide. The Israeli Daily Haaretz reported on December 29, 2008, that government and opposition leaders across the globe, but mainly in Southeast Asia, Africa, and South America, referred to the atrocities, even before they fully transpired, as genocide. There were strong criticisms from the West as well, but these sources were more cautious in using the term genocide. Nonetheless, the G word frequently surfaced in the commentaries conveyed through alternative media, bloggers, and websites. Even before the Gaza operations in January 2009 occasional references were made to Israeli armed forces, committing acts of genocide. Some 1.4 million people, mostly children, are piled up in one of the most densely populated regions of the world, with no freedom of movement, no place to run and no space to hide. UN relief official Jan Edgeland and Swedish Foreign Minister Jan Eliasson noted of the Israeli forays into Gaza, writing in Lou Figaro. Journalist John Pilger wrote in The New Statesman, A genocide is engulfing the people of Gaza while silence engulfs its bystanders. In that same month repeated Israeli actions against the children in Gaza prompted similar expressions of concern. From some unlikely sources, the internationally renowned jurist and Princeton professor of law, Richard Falk, wrote in that year that, It is especially painful for me, as an American Jew, to feel compelled to portray the ongoing and intensifying abuse of the Palestinian people by Israel, through a reliance on such an inflammatory metaphor as the Holocaust. The January 2009 events were referred to in similar terms by the pro-Western Arab media organs. One such source was the Dubai-based satellite network Al Arabia. On December 28, 2008, when the massive Israeli killing had just begun, although already resulting in unprecedented TED numbers of dead children and women, the network reported the popular protests around the world against the Israeli actions. The headline was, World Stands United Against Genocide, in Gaza. It reported that, protesters from Denmark, Turkey, Pakistan, Cyprus, Bahrain, Kuwait, Iran, Sudan and even Israel all called for an end to what most demonstrators termed as a genocide, in Gaza. This was not the mainstream media's opinion in the West, nor was it voiced in such a manner by any members of the political elite in North America or Europe. But within the balance of power between hegemonic and counter-hegemonic voices, the latter included senior politicians in the rest of the world, the widest coalitions of the political left and of human rights organizations in the West coupled with some influential voices from within the Western media. The journalist John Pilger referred to the events in Gaza as genocide in the New Statesman again on January 21, 2009. In the aftermath of the event more voices joined in. Participants in the main demonstration in London on January 19, 2009, carried placards about the genocide in Gaza. Similar banners were raised in a massive demonstration in Copenhagen. Elsewhere, the Malaysian foreign minister in April 2009 described the attack on Gaza as genocide. One can understand why Judge Goldstone refrained from such language. His report as noted corroborates the evidence collected by those who described these policies as genocidal but sums them up as war crimes that require further investigation. Goldstone's report also uses the same language for the Hamas missile attack on Israel. This seems to be more lip service than a genuine point. The imbalance of the aggressor's power and destruction and the victim's pathetic military response deserves different language. Moreover, 
when one reads the thorough and brave report of Judge Goldstone, one should remember that the 1,500 killed, thousands of wounded, and tens of thousands who lost their homes do not tell the whole story. It is the decision to employ such fierce military force in a civilian space that should be discussed. This kind of firepower can only produce the kind of horrific destruction we have seen in Gaza. It was used for this purpose. The nature of the military operations also displayed an Israeli military wish to experiment with new weapons, all intended to kill civilians as part of what the former chief of the army's general staff, Moshe Yolon, termed as the need to brand in the Palestinian consciousness the fearsome might of the Israeli army. Chapter 8 A Middle East Peace That Could Happen, But Won't the fact that the Israel-Palestine conflict grinds on without resolution might appear to be rather strange. For many of the world's conflicts, it is difficult even to conjure up a feasible settlement. In this case, it is not only possible, but there is near universal agreement on its basic contours, a two-state settlement along the internationally recognized, pre-June 1967, borders, with minor and mutual modifications, to adopt official U.S. terminology before Washington departed from the international community in the mid-1970s. The basic principles have been accepted by virtually the entire world, including the Arab states, who go on to call for full normalization of relations, the Organization of Islamic States, including Iran, and relevant non-state actors, including Hamas. A settlement along these lines was first proposed at the UN Security Council in January 1976, by the major Arab states. Israel refused to attend the session. The United States vetoed the resolution, and did so again in 1980. The record at the General Assembly since is similar. There was one important and revealing break in U.S.-Israeli rejectionism. After the failed Camp David agreements in 2000, President Clinton recognized that the terms he and Israel had proposed were unacceptable to any Palestinians. That December, he proposed his parameters, imprecise, but more forthcoming. He then stated that both sides had accepted the parameters, while expressing reservations. Israeli and Palestinian negotiators met in Taba, Egypt in January 2001 to resolve the differences and were making considerable progress. In their final press conference, they reported that, with a little more time, they could probably have reached full agreement. Israel called off the negotiations prematurely, however, and official progress then terminated, though informal discussions at a high level continued, leading to the Geneva Accord rejected by Israel and ignored by the United States. A good deal has happened since, but a settlement along those lines is still not out of reach, if, of course, Washington is once again willing to accept it. Unfortunately, there is little sign of that. Substantial mythology has been created about the entire record, but the basic facts are clear enough and quite well documented. The United States and Israel have been acting in tandem to extend and deepen the occupation. In 2005, recognizing that it was pointless to subsidize a few thousand Israeli settlers in Gaza, who were appropriating substantial resources and protected by a large part of the Israeli army, the government of Ariel Sharon decided to move them to the much more valuable West Bank and Golan Heights. Instead of carrying out the operation straightforwardly, as would have been easy enough, the government decided to stage a national trauma, which virtually duplicated the farce accompanying the withdrawal from the Sinai Desert after the Camp David Agreements of 1978-79. In each case, the withdrawal permitted the cry of, never again, which meant in practice, we cannot abandon an inch of the Palestinian territories that we want to take in violation of international law. 
This farce played very well in the West, though it was ridiculed by more astute Israeli commentators, among them that country's prominent sociologist the late Baruch Kimmerling. After its formal withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, Israel never actually relinquished its total control over the territory, often described realistically as the world's largest prison. In January 2006, a few months after the withdrawal, Palestine had an election that was recognized as free and fair by international observers. Palestinians, however, voted the wrong way, electing Hamas. Instantly, the United States and Israel intensified their assault against Gazans as punishment for this misdeed. The facts and the reasoning were not concealed, rather, they were openly published alongside reverential commentary on Washington's sincere dedication to democracy. The U.S.-backed Israeli assault against the Gazans has only been intensified since, thanks to violence and economic strangulation, increasingly savage. Meanwhile in the West Bank, always. With firm U.S. backing, Israel has been carrying forward long-standing programs to take the valuable land and resources of the Palestinians, and leave them in unviable cantons, mostly out of sight. Israeli commentators frankly refer to these goals as in neocolonial. Ariel Sharon, the main architect of the settlement programs, called these cantons Bantustans, though the term is misleading. South Africa needed the majority black workforce, while Israel would be happy if the Palestinians disappeared, and its policies are directed to that end. One step toward cantonization and the undermining of hopes for Palestinian national survival is the separation of Gaza from the West Bank. These hopes have been almost entirely consigned to oblivion, an atrocity to which we should not contribute by tacit consent. Israeli journalist Amira Haas, one of the leading specialists on Gaza, writes that the restrictions on Palestinian movement that Israel introduced in January 1991 reversed a process that had been initiated in June 1967. Back then, and for the first time since 1948, a large portion of the Palestinian people again lived in the open territory of a single country, to be sure, one that was occupied, but was nevertheless whole, the total separation of the Gaza Strip from. The West Bank is one of the greatest achievements of Israeli politics, whose overarching objective is to prevent a solution based on international decisions and understandings and instead dictate an arrangement, based on Israel's military superiority. Since January 1991, Israel has bureaucratical, ly and logistically merely perfected the split and the separation, not only between Palestinians in the occupied territories and their brothers in Israel, but also between the Palestinian residents of Jerusalem and those in the rest of the territories and between Gazans and West Bankers slash Jerusalemites. Jews live in this same piece of land within a superior and separate system of privileges, laws, services, physical infrastructure, and freedom of movement. The leading academic specialist on Gaza, Harvard scholar Sarah Roy, adds, Gaza is an example of a society that has been deliberately reduced to a state of abject destitution, its once productive population transformed into one of aid-dependent paupers. Gaza's subjection began long before Israel's recent war against it, December 2008. The Israeli occupation, now largely forgotten or denied by the international community, has devastated Gaza's economy and people, especially since 2006. After Israel's December 2008 assault, Gaza's already compromised conditions have become virtually unlivable. Livelihoods, homes, and public infrastructure have been damaged or destroyed on a scale that even the Israel Defense Forces admitted was indefensible. In Gaza today, there is no private sector to speak of and no industry. 
80% of Gaza's agricultural crops were destroyed and Israel continues to snipe at farmers attempting to plant and tend fields near the well-fenced and patrolled border. Most productive activity has been extinguished today. 96% of Gaza's population of 1.4 million is dependent on humanitarian aid for basic needs. According to the World Food Programme, the Gaza Strip requires a minimum of 400 trucks of food every day just to meet the basic nutritional needs of the population. Yet, despite a March 22, 2009, decision by the Israeli cabinet to lift all restrictions on foodstuffs entering Gaza. Only 653 trucks of food and other supplies were allowed entry during the week of May 10, at best meeting 23% of required need. Israel now allows only 30 to 40 commercial items to enter Gaza compared to 4,000 approved products, prior to June 2006. It cannot be too often stressed that Israel had no credible pretext for its 2008-9 attack on Gaza, with full U.S. support and illegally using U.S. weapons. Near-universal opinion asserts the contrary, claiming that Israel was acting in self-defense. That is utterly unsustainable, in light of Israel's flat rejection of peaceful means that were readily available as Israel and its U.S. partner in crime knew very well. That aside, Israel's siege of Gaza is itself an act of war, as Israel of all countries certainly recognizes, having repeatedly justified launching major wars on grounds of partial restrictions on its access to the outside world, though nothing remotely like what it has long imposed on Gaza. One crucial element of Israel's criminal siege, little reported, is the naval blockade. Peter Beaumont reports from Gaza that, on its coastal littoral, Gaza's limitations are marked by a different fence where the bars are Israeli gunboats with their huge wakes, scurrying beyond the Palestinian fishing boats and preventing them from going outside a zone imposed by the warships. For according to reports from the scene, the naval siege has been tightened steadily since 2000. Fishing boats have been driven steadily out of Gaza's territorial waters and toward the shore by Israeli gunboats, often violently without warning and with many casualties. As a result of these naval actions, Gaza's fishing industry has virtually collapsed, fishing is impossible near shore. Because of the contamination caused by Israel's regular attacks, including the destruction of power plants and sewage facilities, these Israeli naval attacks began shortly after the discovery by the BG, British Gas, group of what appear to be quite sizable natural gas fields in Gaza's territorial waters. Industry journals report that Israel is already appropriating these Gazan resources for its own use, part of its commitment to shift its economy to natural gas. The Standard Industry Source reports. Israel's finance ministry has given the Israel Electric Corporation, IEC, approval to purchase larger quantities of natural gas from BG than originally agreed upon, according to Israeli government sources, which, said the state-owned utility would be able to negotiate for as much as 1.5 billion cubic meters of natural gas from the marine field located off the Mediterranean coast of the Palestinian-controlled Gaza Strip. Last year the Israeli government approved the purchase of 800 million cubic meters of gas from the field by the IEC. Recently the Israeli government changed its policy and decided the state-owned utility could buy the entire quantity of gas from the Gaza marine field. Previously the government had said the IEC could buy half the total amount and the remainder would be bought by private power producers. The pillage of what could become a major source of income for Gaza is surely known to U.S. authorities. It is only reasonable to suppose that the intention to appropriate these limited resources, either by Israel alone or together with the collaborationist Palestinian Authority, 
is the motive for preventing Gazan fishing boats from entering Gaza's territorial waters. There are some instructive precedents. In 1989, Australian Foreign Minister Gareth Evans signed a treaty with his Indonesian counterpart Ali Alatas granting Australia rights to the substantial oil reserves in the Indonesian province of East Timor. The Indonesia-Australia Timor Gap Treaty, which offered not a crumb to the people whose oil was being stolen, is the only legal agreement anywhere in the world that effectively recognizes Indonesia's right to rule East Timor, the Australian press reported. Asked about his willingness to recognize the Indonesian conquest and to rob the sole resource of the conquered territory, which had been subjected to near-genocidal slaughter by the Indonesian invader with the strong support of Australia, along with the United States, the United Kingdom, and some others, Evans explained that, there is no binding legal obligation not to recognize the acquisition of territory that was acquired by force, adding that, the world is a pretty unfair place, littered with examples of acquisition by force. It should, then, be unproblematic for Israel to follow suit in Gaza. A few years later, Evans became the leading figure in the campaign to introduce the concept, responsibility to protect, known as R2P, into international law. R2P is intended to establish an international NAL obligation to protect populations from grave crimes. Evans is the author of a major book on the subject and was co-chair of the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, which issued what is considered the basic document on R2P. In an article devoted to this idealistic effort to establish a new humanitarian principle, the London Economist featured Evans and his bold but passionate claim on behalf of a three-word expression which, in quite large part thanks to his efforts, now belongs to the language of diplomacy, the responsibility to protect. The article is accompanied by a picture of Evans with the caption, Evans, a lifelong passion to protect. His hand is pressed to his forehead in despair over the difficulties faced by his idealistic effort. The magazine chose not to run a different photo that circulates in Australia, depicting Evans and Alatas exuberantly clasping their hands together as they toast the Timor Gap Treaty that they had just signed. Though a protected population, under international law, Gazans do not fall under the jurisdiction of the responsibility to protect, joining other unfortunates, in accord with the maxim of Thucydides, that the strong do as they wish, and the weak suffer as they must, which holds with its customary precision. The kinds of restrictions on movement used to destroy Gaza have long been in force in the West Bank as well, less cruelly but with grim effects on life and the economy. The World Bank reports that Israel has established a complex closure regime that restricts Palestinian access to large areas of the West Bank. The Palestinian economy has remained stagnant, largely because of the sharp downturn in Gaza and Israel's continued restrictions on Palestinian trade and movement in the West Bank. The World Bank cited Israeli roadblocks and checkpoints hindering trade and travel, as well as restrictions on Palestinian building in the West Bank where the Western-backed government of Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas holds sway. Israel does permit, indeed encourage, a privileged existence for elites in Ramallah and sometimes elsewhere, largely relying on European funding, a traditional feature of colonial and neo-colonial practice. All this constitutes what Israeli activist Jeff Halper calls a matrix of control to subdue the colonized population. These systematic programs over more than 40 years aim to establish Defense Minister Moshe Dayan's recommendation to his colleagues shortly after Israel's 1967 conquests that we must tell the Palestinians in the territories, we have no solution, you shall continue to live like dogs, and whoever wishes may leave, and we will see where this process leads, too.
Turning to the second bone of contention, settlements, there is indeed a confrontation, but it is rather less dramatic than portrayed. Washington's position was presented most strongly in Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's much-quoted statement rejecting natural growth exceptions to the policy opposing new settlements. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, along with President Shimon Peres and, in fact, virtually the whole Israeli political spectrum, insists on permitting natural growth within the areas that Israel intends to annex, complaining that the United States is backing down on George. W. Bush's authorization of such expansion within his vision of a Palestinian state. Senior Netanyahu cabinet members have gone further. Transportation Minister Yisrael Katz announced that the current Israeli government will not accept in any way the freezing of legal settlement activity in Judea and Samaria. The term illegal in U.S.-Israeli parlance means illegal, but authorized by the government of Israel with a wink from Washington. In this usage, unauthorized outposts are termed illegal, though apart from the dictates of the powerful, they are no more illegal than the settlements granted to Israel under Bush's evision and Obama's scrupulous omission. The Obama-Clinton hardball formulation is not new. It repeats the wording of the Bush administration draft of the 2003 roadmap, which stipulates that in Phase 1, Israel freezes all settlement activity, including natural growth of settlements. All sides formally accept the road map, modified to drop the phrase, natural growth, consistently overlooking the fact that Israel, with U.S. support, at once added 14 reservations, that render it inoperable. If Obama were at all serious about opposing settlement expansion, he could easily proceed with concrete measures by, for example, reducing U.S. aid by the amount devoted to this purpose. That would hardly be a radical or courageous move. The Bush I administration did. So, reducing loan guarantees, but after the Oslo Accord in 1993, President Clinton left calculations to the government of Israel. Unsurprisingly, there was no change in the expenditures flowing to the settlements, the Israeli press reported. Prime Minister, Rabin will continue not to dry out the settlements, the report concludes. And the Americans? They will understand. Obama administration officials informed the press that the Bush I measures are not under discussion, and that pressures will be largely symbolic. In short, Obama understands, just as Clinton and Bush too did. At best, settlement expansion is a side issue, rather like the issue of illegal outposts, namely those that the government of Israel has not authorized. Concentration on these issues diverts attention from the fact that there are no legal outposts, and that it is the existing settlements that are the primary problem to be faced. The U.S. press reports that a partial freeze has been in place for several years, but settlers have found ways around the strictures. Construction in the settlements has slowed but never stopped continuing at an annual rate of about 1,500 to 2,000 units over the past three years. If building continues at the 2008 rate, the 46,500 units already approved will be completed in about 20 years. If Israel built all the housing units already approved in the nation's overall master plan for settlements, it would almost double the number of settler homes in the West Bank. Peace Now, which monitors settlement activities, estimates further that the two largest settlements would double in size, Ariel and Maile. Adumim, built mainly during the Oslo years in the salients that subdivide the West Bank into cantons. Natural population growth is largely a myth, Israel's leading diplomatic correspondent, Akiva Eldar, points out, citing demographic studies by Colonel Rez. Shal Ari Eli, 
Deputy Military Secretary to former Prime Minister and incumbent Defense Minister Ehud Barak. Settlement growth consists largely of Israeli immigrants in violation of the Geneva Conventions, assisted with generous subsidies. Much of it is in direct violation of formal government decisions, but carried out with the authorization of the government, specifically Barak, considered a dove in the Israeli spectrum. Correspondent Jackson Deal derides the long dormant Palestinian fantasy, revived by President Abbas, that the United States will simply force Israel to make critical concessions, whether or not its democratic government agrees. He does not explain why refusal to participate in Israel's illegal expansion, which, if serious, would force Israel to make critical concessions, would be improper interference in Israel's democracy. Returning to reality, all these discussions about settlement expansion evade the most crucial issue about settlements, what the United States and Israel have already established in the West Bank. The evasion tacitly concedes that the illegal settlement programs already in place are somehow acceptable, putting aside the Golan Heights, annexed in violation of Security Council orders, though the Bush vision, apparently accepted by Obama, moves from tacit to explicit support for these violations of law. What is in place already suffices to ensure that there can be no viable Palestinian self-determination. Hence, there is every indication that even on the unlikely assumption that natural growth will be ended, U.S. Israeli rejectionism will persist, blocking the international consensus as before. Subsequently, Prime Minister Netanyahu declared a 10 month suspension of new construction, with many exemptions, and entirely excluding Greater Jerusalem where expropriation in Arab areas and construction for Jewish settlers continues at a rapid pace. Hillary Clinton praised these unprecedented concessions on illegal construction, eliciting anger and ridicule in much of the world. It might be different if a legitimate land swap were under consideration. A solution approached at Taba and spelled out more fully in the Geneva Accord reached in informal high-level Israel-Palestine negotiations. The accord was presented in Geneva in October 2003, welcomed by much of the world, rejected by Israel, and ignored by the United States. Barack Obama's June 4, 2009 Cairo address to the Muslim world kept pretty much to his well-honed blank slate style, with little of substance, but presented in a personable manner that allows listeners to write on the slate what they want to hear. CNN captured its spirit by headlining a report, Obama looks to reach the soul of the Muslim world. Obama had announced the goals of his address in an interview with New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman. We have a joke around the White House, the president said. We're just going to keep on telling the truth until it stops working and nowhere is truth-telling more important than the Middle East. The White House commitment is most welcome, but it is useful to see how it translates into practice. Point 19. Obama admonished his audience that it is easy to point fingers, but if we see this conflict only from one side or the other, then we will be blind to the truth, the only resolution is for the aspirations of both sides to be met through two states, where Israelis and Palestinians each live in peace and security. Turning from Obama Friedman truth to truth, there is a third side, with a decisive role throughout, the United States. But that participant in the conflict Obama omitted. The omission is understood to be normal and appropriate, Hence unmentioned, Friedman's column is headlined, Obama speech aimed at both Arabs and Israelis. The front-page Wall Street Journal report on Obama's speech appears under the heading, Obama chides Israel, Arabs in his overture to Muslims. Other reports are the same. The convention is understandable on the doctrinal principle that though the U.S. government sometimes makes mistakes, 
its intentions are by definition benign, even noble. In the world of attractive imagery, Washington has always sought desperately to be an honest broker, yearning to advance peace and justice. The doctrine trumps truth, of which there is little hint in the speech or the mainstream coverage of it. Obama once again echoed Bush's vision of two states, without saying what he meant by the phrase, Palestinian state. His intentions were clarified not only by the crucial omissions discussed elsewhere, but also by his one explicit criticism of Israel. The United States does not accept the legitimacy of continued Israeli settlements. This construction violates previous agreements and undermines efforts to achieve peace. It is time for these settlements to stop. That is, Israel should live up to Phase 1 of the 2003 roadmap, rejected at once by Israel with tacit U.S. support, as noted, though the truth is that Obama has ruled out even steps of the Bush I variety to withdraw from. Participation in these crimes The operative words are illegitimacy, and, continued. It is useful to recall that it was Netanyahu's 1996 government that was the first in Israel to use the phrase, Palestinian state. It agreed that Palestinians can call whatever fragments of Palestine are left to them a state if they like, or they can call them a fried chicken. By omission, Obama indicates that he accepts Bush's vision, the vast existing settlement and Infrastructure projects are illegitimate, thus ensuring that the phrase, Palestinian state, means a fried chicken. Always even-handed, Obama also had an admonition for the Arab states, they, must recognize that the Arab Peace Initiative was an important beginning, but not the end of their responsibilities. Plainly, however, it cannot be a meaningful beginning if Obama continues to reject its core principles. Implementation of the International Consensus To do so, however, is evidently not Washington's responsibility in Obama's vision, no explanation given, no notice taken. On democracy, Obama said that, we would not presume to pick the outcome of a peaceful election, as in January 2006, when Washington picked the outcome with a vengeance turning at once to severe punishment of the Palestinians because it did not like the outcome of a peaceful election, all with Obama's apparent approval judging by his words before, and actions since, taking office. Obama politely refrained from comment about his host, President Mubarak, one of the most brutal dictators in the region, though he has had some illuminating words about him as he was about to board a plane to Saudi Arabia and Egypt, the two moderate Arab states. Mr. Obama signaled that while he would mention American concerns about human rights in Egypt, he would not challenge Mr. Mubarak too sharply, because he is a force for stability and good in the Middle East. Mr. Obama said he did not regard Mr. Mubarak as an authoritarian leader. No. I tend not to use labels for folks, Mr. Obama said. The president noted that there had been criticism of the manner in which politics operates in Egypt, but he also said that Mr. Mubarak had been a stalwart ally, in many respects, to the United States. When a politician uses the word of folks, we should brace ourselves for the deceit, or worse, that is coming. Outside of this context, there are people, or often villains, and using labels for them is highly meritorious. Obama is right, however, not to have used the word authoritarian, which is far too mild a label for his friend. Just as in the past, support for democracy, and for human rights as well, keeps to the pattern that scholarship has repeatedly discovered, correlating closely with strategic and economic objectives. There should be little difficulty in understanding why those whose eyes are not closed tight shut by rigid doctrine, dismiss Obama's yearning for human rights and democracy as a joke in bad taste. Acknowledgements 
This book would not have been possible without the help and support of the following people. Noam Chomsky, who answered my first email many years ago and has continued to do so throughout the years, in spite of their number. I still do not know how you do it. Thank you. Elon Papp, thank you for being approachable, an amazing speaker, and, also for answering my numerous emails. You are both true inspirations for being incredibly professional, sticking to your ethics, and talking the talk, walking the walk. Thanks to Anthony Amov for helping me making the book what it is today. Thank you to Mickey Smith and Jesse Kindig, who spent many hours helping with research on EndNotes. Many thanks to Dow Tran at Haymarket for turning a manuscript into a book and making the editing smooth and easy. Thanks to Caroline Luft for her detailed copy editing. My brother Florent, for being my loyal companion throughout the years and without whom this book might never have existed. My friend Hervé Landecker, for making me laugh, always, and being a great manager. I wish I had met you earlier, but as the saying goes, mu vot tard ke jame. Maria, thanks for your help with the interviews and for always having remained so enthusiastic about this project. Thanks to members of Lambeth and Wandsworth Palestine Solidarity Campaign, for their contribution in the 2007 Chomsky interview. Huge thanks to Udi Ava Jaziewicz for her very constructive and helpful comments on the introduction, and for everything she taught me in the last few months. May, Mum, Dad, and Faye, thanks for being there, always. I love you. Jean, if God existed, I would kneel down and ask him not to intervene when it came to you, not to touch a hair on your head, to leave you as you are. Finally, thanks to the people of Palestine for their steadfastness and thanks to all the international human rights activists, supporting their universal struggle. You are the real heroes of this world.